Well, today we're going to be talking about uh, Kathy Pice's new book, a copy of it here, Information Hunters. Uh, it's really a fascinating read uh, about how the U.S. military engaged uh, librarians and archivists in on a really massive information gathering expedition, and which led them into other areas of um, uh, of information science and also launched all kinds of different projects. Uh, it's a really fascinating book. And so, uh, Kathy, what I'd first like you to do is uh, sort of tell us a bit about the book and how you, uh, how you fell into the project. Um, sure, and thank you very much for having me here. It's really a great pleasure to be able to talk about my project with this audience. Um, the, the book actually started from a family story. I stumbled upon the life of a relative of mine, my father's oldest brother named Reuben Pice, who unfortunately died before I was born. And I really knew very little about his life other than that he was a librarian. And one day doing a Google search, I came across this um, surprising information that he had been in the Office of Strategic Services during World War II, and the OSS, as it was known, was the first civilian intelligence agency in the United States, essentially a precursor to the CIA. And after the war, he had headed a mission of the Library of Congress in Europe. And so I just began to poke around, trying to find out what I could about his life. And the way historians kind of fall into projects, I fell into this one and discovered a remarkable array of librarians, archivists, scholars, military personnel who were involved in the collection and dissemination of books, periodicals, and documents during World War II. In other words, book culture, print culture became part of their war effort or key to their war effort. Um, so the project kind of took off from there and I looked at um, several aspects of this history, including intelligence gathering, what's now known as open source intelligence, um, the decisions around um, confiscating books of, with Nazi content or militaristic content, the efforts of research libraries to, make, to build their collections, um, and also the um, fate of the looted Jewish books and the involvement in Americans um, in um, rescuing and um, identifying and distributing those books. So in general, I was especially interested, not so much in top-down policies, but in the ways that ordinary people kind of fell into this kind of war work. And um, it was an experience that changed their lives. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that really fascinated me about the book was uh, that, you know, I think when people typically think about, you know, World War II and the American war effort, uh, you know, you naturally think of soldiers and, and you know, military affairs. Um, you know, you can, you can get into intelligence and spy craft and, and things like that. Uh, but, you know, I hadn't necessarily considered that librarians uh, could play such a significant role in, uh, you know, in the war effort. So, I, you know, I thought that was really fascinating that, you um, uh, that and it what it did it is is it broadened the concept of the entire effort, uh, and you know when you I'm just wondering if when you got into that if that's something you considered. Um, I mean, I, you know what's interesting also here is I think you're not a World War II historian, uh, you're a historian of popular culture, and so to a certain degree this book, you know, is kind of the odd man out in in your collection of works, um, but you know did did. You know, did you ever anticipate, um, you know, obviously you got into it because of your uncle, uh, but, you know, did you ever anticipate finding what you what you were able to find? Um, that's such a great question. Um, I came to this knowing basically nothing. And um, as you say, I'm a historian of popular culture and gender and sexuality. And, um, you know, in some ways I can kind of trace my the way that I approach this back to the way that I approach those other subjects, but I, I could not have given a lecture on World War II other than the home front before I got started on this project. And I really did need to learn 
about how the war was waged and what kind of role these um, non-military activities played in bolstering the war effort. And I, I think what struck me very early on, um, when I discovered this story of my relative, it was around the time that the um, United States had um, waged the second war in Iraq. And there was a lot of looting and destruction of cultural material, libraries, uh, the Iraqi Museum. And um, that, that uh, conjuncture kind of um, sparked my interest in the cultural dimensions of World War II. And what I think is a pretty different story with the Monuments Men, which is a kind of well-known group of um, people preserving art treasures and um, cultural monuments. Um, so my path into this was um, the interest of a cultural historian, but I was um, completely surprised by what I found, continually surprised. Right. Um, yeah, and it, it's, you know, the, the, the very idea, and I, 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 when I first came across the term open source uh, in your book, I thought, oh, that seems anachronistic. It's, it's, you know, this is something that's used, you know, today. Um, but it fit very well. I found that you know, I found that it fit very well because the whole idea was that there is information to be gleaned. There's intelligence to be gleaned from all kinds of publications uh, that are, you know, theoretically readily available. And you know, who better to uh, to find this information than librarians who who are looking for it anyways. I mean, you also have book dealers and, and, and people like that, but it's, uh, you, I, you know, I thought that was, you know, just the sense of uh, the availability of information. It's something that I, you know, never thought of, um, you know, nowadays you do, but then it was something, you know, I never considered. Right. I mean, this was a, you know, pre-computer period. Um, people um, did not um, necessarily have the kind, I mean, they didn't have the kinds of finding aids that we have today that are readily available at our fingertips. Um, what the um, founder of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, believed, and he worked very closely, interestingly, with the Librarian of Congress at the time, who was Archibald McLeish, the famous playwright and poet, who also believed that information um, in the sense of the content of books, um, new, current newspapers, scientific reports, um, technical manuals, that this content could be disaggregated into bundles, essentially into bundles of intelligence and could be um, read and used by war agencies in order to, um, for example, determine uh, the movement of troops potentially, the um, industrial situation in Germany and in occupied countries. They were interested as well in the morale of um, the German people and the and current newspapers could give you some of that information if you read them carefully and analyze them carefully. Right, you know, I, I one has to assume that the Germans were doing the same thing. You know, that they, you know, I, I actually, I wonder if that ever came out that there were German librarians doing, you know, performing similar work. Um, you know, had you heard of that? Well, there was a lot of concern that there would be a German um, uh, intelligence agent invasion of the United States. And there was a, a certain degree of counterintelligence work being done by the FBI actually at this time to prevent that from happening. There was concern about, um, you know, scholars of German history and German literature and where their loyalties lay. Um, it was, I think, more common for German intelligence agents to use um, um, neutral sites, uh, neutral cities like Lisbon, um, Stockholm, um, parts of, uh, you know, Cairo, for example, and to um, at Lisbon, especially, where they would, you know, purchase up um, whatever kinds of newspapers and other materials would be available. So I think at a somewhat lesser level, they were involved in this kind of work, but they, I don't think they were reading American newspapers, except for propaganda purposes to turn, um, you know, to show, you know, that materialistic Americans um, could not possibly value um, the culture of Europe. You know, so for propaganda use, but not necessarily for um, larger intelligence use. 
Right. That's, it's really interesting what you just said about Americans being unable to value the culture of Europe because that was, you, you know, it's, it seemed to me that there were some people involved in OSS that, you know, you know, hoped to save the culture of Europe by saving these these documents and these books. Um, you know, that they would all like this is closer to the end of the book, I guess. Um, you know, where uh, you know, they're 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 finding all of these materials that were stolen, you know, rare cultural materials stolen by the Nazis. Uh, and they uh, you know, their their goal is to save European civilization. Um, so that's somewhat ironic. Right. Well, it, I mean, interestingly, with the Monuments Men, I mean, the, the, that program um, develops early. You know, 1943 is a lot of discussion of, of preserving um, European cultural heritage and it being seen as the heritage of the United States. And um, Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, speaks to this um, uh, right before the campaign in Italy. And so I think many of the scholars, um, librarians, um, and people who, you know, um, there are many ordinary GIs with educations, even high school educations or college educations who value European um, culture and literature and see a kind of investment in this as part of the reason that they're fighting the war. Right. Um, you know, one of the things, and I, I guess this is sort of a personal thing because I, I've used it a lot in my academic career, um, but microfilm plays a very significant role and it's a new phenomenon. And, um, you know, other things develop later out of this, but I, I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit about that. Um, yes, yeah, so microfilm is incredibly important. And for any of us who had to use it in order to write um, books, um, it's the most headache inducing form of technology ever <laughs> created for reading purposes. But at the time in the 1930s, actually, there's a real um, belief that, um, you know, that microfilm brings certain kinds of advantages that the printed page does not. One is that it's, it's um, can be reproduced very um, inexpensively and distributed very inexpensively. It can contain large quantities of materials. And so when the OSS, and just to, um, I have a question here about, you know, are we talking about military or non-military people? The OSS was a civilian agency and sent civilians um, around the world to do intelligence work um, within a few years of their of its founding, it becomes closely allied with military operations. And so there's a kind of military um, overlay or uh, framework in which they operate. Um, but they cannot, um, you know, they gather up all of these heavy periodicals and cannot ship them back to the United States. Um, you know, the space on, an, on airplanes, for example, is quite limited the weight, the volume is too much, and they need to get this material back to the US in a timely manner. And so these uh, librarians stationed around um, neutral cities or in neutral cities um, set up microfilm units um, often in the, um, the US embassies um, or consulates and just microfilm massive quantities of material, like within a year over one and a half million pages of material were microfilmed. Um, and these were very disordered. There was a whole problem of how do you org how do you know what you're looking for if there's no, you know, finding aid. Um, but that was a problem that the librarians back in Washington had to solve. But the but microfilm provided a very um, powerful technology to minimize the weight and um, uh, volume of material and have it be able to be returned to either Washington or to London. Right, and and you know when you preface this by saying it's the most headache-inducing you know way to do research, that's true. Um, I've spent endless hours doing it. Uh, but and and one of the things I thought was that they're microfilming you know millions and millions of pages. Who is going to read this when it gets back to the states? Who's going to be able to read and analyze this? It's it's they're you know I I just imagine these sort of you know long tables of microfilm readers with all of these people sitting at them. And I mean, I don't know if that existed, but it, it, it's, uh, I, I somehow, you know, empathize with the people who had to do the work. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, they didn't have a lot of microfilm readers because it was a fairly new technology. Right. And 
And, uh, you know, there were these constraints on using metals and, um, and uh, the celluloid, you know, as, as materials that needed to be conserved for the war effort. And so you might have one or two microfilm readers in say the war department, um, the solution to this, there were a lot of complaints saying, we just can't read all of this. Um, the solution was that the OSS hired, a, you know, several hundred people, mainly women and emigres, who went through each microfilm reel, organized it by, you know, here's the topic, here's the little nuggets of information, created a daily index that was sent out to all the war agencies, and offered to provide abstracts and direct translations um, in many languages, I think up to 44 languages. So um, it was a, you know, today we'd have computers to help us with this. Right. At the time, you just hired a lot of people to, um, to make this material usable. Wow, that's, that's incredible. Um, you know, and I, I just have to point out that one of the, um, one of the figures involved in this microfilming project was a woman by the name of Adele Kibre who is really fascinating. Uh, so I, I just was wondering if you'd like, be willing to talk about her a bit. I, I found her so compelling. Yes, yeah, so Adele, I think it's pronounced Kyver. Adele Kyver okay. um, is, is an amazing woman and she sort of um, was lost to history. Um, uh, and fortunately I found enough about her to, you know, to talk about her in um, the book. And I actually have to thank um, her nephew, who gave me a, a certain amount of inside information about her. She was a woman who grew up in Hollywood, California. Um, part of her family was connected to the film industry. She was clearly really smart, uh, went to the University of Chicago to do a PhD in medieval linguistics in 1930. And of course, um, this was not a time when women were getting academic jobs. Um, and she went to Europe essentially to work as a research assistant for University of Chicago professors interested in rare books and manuscripts in the great libraries of Europe, in the Vatican Library, in the Bibliothèque Nationale, et cetera. And she um, learned how to photograph these materials, first using just a plain camera, and then learning how to do the microfilm um, technology. And she is sent by the, after the war is declared, um, she is sent to Stockholm to head the Anglo-American microfilm unit, which is a collaborative effort of British intelligence and the Americans um, to bring as many of these um, timely newspapers, uh, um, periodicals, a lot of resistance and underground literature, bring them in to, the mic to be microfilmed. And she was enormously productive. She produced over 3000 reels of microfilm in the several years that she was there in Stockholm. Um, and as a kind of uh, mysterious woman in many ways, she knew how to keep a secret. <laughs> yeah, that's obviously important. Um, you know, and I guess I could also point out that uh, um, one of the outgrowths of um, the you this use of microfilm uh, wound up producing UMI, which became ProQuest, uh, which is I guess it's got to be the largest, you know, microfilm, and, and I guess it's, it does much Digital. more than microfilm now, but it uh, it's um, it's it's a really big uh, organization. Yeah, so um, there's some interesting kind of law, like if you trace the threads of some of the people who were initially involved in this effort, um, Eugene Power, who was a, um, an early microfilm booster, um, uh, began University Microfilms International, I think in 1937, and it was a very small operation. And the concept behind it is an interesting one. He had the idea of a, what he called an addition of one. So instead of unlike regular publishers who are producing, you know, print runs of whatever, 10,000 books, um, he would um, tar it. This was about niche publishing. If you as a scholar need to read this, my, uh, this um, dissertation, you can get that one copy. He was very instrumental in training the American uh, librarians and other um, OSS um, personnel in doing this microfilming. And he, was ba he did a lot of work in London. And then when he came back, his company just really took off and ultimately it did become 
ProQuest. So this kind of history of information science, um, you know, you see a kind of important, um, it's almost like a jumpstart that goes on during the war years, which then leads into the post-war flourishing of um, information science. Right, and it, it's funny because I've used UMI products and ProQuest products for years, and now I know the origin, which is, you know, it, it makes it makes it pretty interesting. Um, so you, you spoke a, bit, a little bit about uh, Adele Kyber. Um, there's another figure in here, in addition to your uncle, uh, Ruben Pice, who's also very interesting, uh, there's a man by the name of Max Loeb, uh, who I also found very compelling. Um, and it's almost as if with some of these characters, you could kind of go off and write a novel. Um, so I'm wondering if you, you know, you could tell, speak a little bit about him. Yeah, I wish I had that skill, That's the skill of a fiction writer. Um, so Max Loeb was an interesting individual and in a way this kind of gets to one of the questions in the, or the impression in the, in the Q&A about you know, whether these information hunters are um, only dedicated to intelligence. Um, Max Loeb um, was a German emigre. Um, he goes to New York and um, is a bookseller, essentially. Uh, he is, um, I believe he's drafted into the army. He becomes an American citizen. And he is sent, um, uh, because of his language skills, and he had also worked as a journalist in Germany, um, he is attached to um, an intelligence unit. And Max Loeb um, finds himself in, in England, um, and there's a lot of questions about what happened to the various um, booksellers, publishers, libraries, and other kinds of materials of, of book um, culture in Germany, had they been moved, have they said they've been bombed, were they saved? And there are a number of prisoners of war in England who were in the German book trade. And so he takes it upon himself, it's his own idea. He goes and interviews them. And we have the records of these long interviews. He writes these long reports and he is able to find in many cases where book collections have been moved there's other kinds of, of intelligence information that he's able to glean and his reports become sort of required reading by the OSS um, leadership and even by the um, British um, um, Foreign Office. After the war, um, he and a number of other people like Ruben Pice move from intelligence work towards the work of the um, Library of Congress and American research libraries working with the military to build up the American collections of books published during the war years in Europe. And uh, this is known as the Library of Congress mission. He finds himself, Max Loeb finds himself going to many different places that are known as targets. Um, you know, an optical, um, the Zeiss optical laboratory takes, you know, 24,000 books. Um, he finds these places where he is able to essentially confiscate large quantities of material that can potentially be analyzed by military intelligence. And if they are not um, useful, they wind up going to the United States. And Max Loeb then ends up, um, you know, there's a certain, I mean, probably people in the book world know that there's a, there's a thing called book lust, you know, the, just the desire for the book um, that, that bibliophiles have. And he was a businessman, he was a bookseller, and he took a number, you know, he kind of diverted a number of books that should have, you know, gone to the Library of Congress or to one of the um, document centers for his own um, um, purposes and selling them in, in, uh, in New York. And that's when I lose the trail on him. Right, it's a good, it's a good trail to follow. Um, he's a very, really compelling character. Um, but so what, what you've just referenced is, um, you know, in the book itself, you know, you have these librarians who are gathering intelligence and information uh, for the war effort. Uh, and then with uh, the end of the war, uh, they take on a different role. Uh, they, be, as you say, they begin uh, collecting for this Library of Congress mission um, and uh, collecting for, for um, uh, you know, American research and university libraries. Uh, 
one interesting thing here is uh, the role of the Hoover Institution, um, which kind of is like a villainous role in a way. I'm mean, not that exactly, but you know, they're they engage in some sort of some kinds of underhanded tactics. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a bit. Yeah, so the Hoover Institution was a wonderful find for me. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that I give a certain amount of latitude towards the, these efforts in, a, in, a, in war zones and in wartime situations. The amount of chaos was just extraordinary. And the idea that somehow you could control everybody's behavior, you know, in picking up books or whatever, um, acquiring documents, it's, it's hard to sort of have that kind of moral expectation on people. The Hoover Library, um, which was founded by um, Herbert Hoover, um, and actually as an outgrowth of World War I, um, he was interested in acquiring the records of war, revolution, and um, political ideologies. And he maintained this extraordinary friendship network and network of colleagues that he had acquired over many years of public service. And at, as the war is ending in Europe, um, he wants desperately to get his agents into, um, into Europe to start collecting all of this material that had been um, produced during the war years. And he is able to, um, you know, there are people who are very loyal to him uh, who were involved in his famine relief campaigns uh, during and after World War I, who are present in Brussels and Paris and putting away material for him. He also has great connections with um, journalists who go to, who because they're journalists, they get press credentials, they go to um, Berlin right when the war is over and begin going out and seeking documents and other kinds of materials. Um, one of the interesting ways that they do this, I think, and telling ways is that they use care packages. Um, you know, that's sort of bundles of food um, to give to um, Germans who might have library collections, as one of um, Hoover's agents put it, this is a way to separate people from their libraries, um, that they were desperately hungry and saw this as a kind of act of friendship, um, not simply as an exchange. And so he was able to really um, build up his those collections at the Hoover Library, the wartime collections are extraordinary. Um, and um, what was great for me was like finding these materials because the Hoover Institution itself, their collecting records are, are not open to researchers, but the Hoover Presidential Library in West Branch, West Branch Iowa, where I spent a very um, pleasant week in the um, cornfields, um, he had actually hidden the collecting efforts under the rubric of one of his relief agencies. So. Um, it was just a very interesting way to, you know, see how um, a private organization could maneuver in a situation that was really under military control. Right. Yeah, that, that's um, it's an amazing story. And then and they and obviously Hoover Institution has an incredible collection. Yeah. And this is part of the reason why. Um, so you mentioned the chaos, uh, you know, of the war and in the, the and of the aftermath of the war. Um, you know, after the war, you describe, you know, books and, you know, other items of cultural value in castles, in homes, in mine shafts, in salt mines. Um, I mean, this is just astounding uh, that, you know, this, this, I mean, obviously, this is also part of the German war effort. They're trying to preserve you know, what they see as, as being of cultural value. Um, and, you know, there's this allied effort after the war to try to find these materials. And these librarians are all part of this. They become, you know, they become part of this. And it's just so fascinating how they find it and, you know, how it all, you know, comes to, you know, fruition in, in you know, a couple of distinct places. Yes. Um, it. I mean, I was really... Um, really surprised by it. I mean, I was aware of all of the materials that had been, you know, um, uh, hidden away for protection that, um, uh, you know, the Nazi looted artworks, for example, and the efforts of the monuments men to uncover them and restore them. But the book situation was, um, was a different one. I mean, books are not as easily identifiable in terms of provenance. 
And although some may have book stamps, some may not, um, or ex libris plate, plates. And the Germans moved vast collections into safekeeping as um, Allied bombing became more and more intense in the last two years of the war. And, um, you know, so the, um, you know, military detachments, army detachments were simply, you know, kind of guided by locals, actually, in many cases to and found, um, you know, in a cave, in a mine, um, in a churchyard or a church cellar, um, you know, materials that might be from a German library, the Prussian State Library, for example, was distributed to about a dozen different sites, you know, with several million books in each site. Um, many of the collections that were found were looted books. Um, so it was, uh, it was really this uh, extraordinary kind of effort and it involved uh, many ordinary, um, ordinary GIs who, you know, I think, I mean, one of the things that really struck me was how quote ordinary GIs, sometimes with a co college education or with an interest in the book world, just became fascinated and kind of driven to find these materials. Um, there was one who was himself a Rhodes Scholar, but he was just a, I think maybe a, a private or a corporal. And when he had like, quote, free time, he would go around in a Jeep and start collecting documents of, of, of Nazism to have a record of this history. And his, um, uh, his commanding officer gave him shelf space in a in a garage and, or in a warehouse. And, you know, he acquired over 100,000 uh, pieces of material, ephemera and the like, uh, which are now all in the Library of Congress. And so there were people who had this kind of compulsion to find out what had happened in the, in the chaos. And I think they played a really important role that, um, you know, is, is well worth recognizing. Right, absolutely. And, and you know, referencing this, this you know, GI who collected the, this Nazi material. Um, I wonder if you can speak to, you know, denazification and, you know, the role that, you know, these, these people played in, uh, in that. Yeah, so when the war ended, of course, there was, um, you know, the occupation government um, of, in the American zone worked to some extent collaborated co co cooperatively with the other um, um, allies, although there were, differences that erupted pretty quickly between the Soviet zone and, and the US um, zone authorities. Um, but what they had, they had agreed on the importance of denazification and not only denazifying, um, at least in the initial phase, trying to get um, people with a Nazi um, affiliation or background out of um, jobs and, and positions, but also with the idea that there was so much ideological damage that had been done through um, books with Nazi content and militaristic content. The, the school books, for example, the textbooks were, you know, even something like physics would use some kind of example that would support um, uh, an idea of Nazi superiority or German superiority. Um, and so initially there was a, a decision to just sort of sequester this material from the schools, from uh, publishers, from bookstores. And over time, this became like the, the, the policy hardened. And by May of 1946, um, there had finally become a four power agreement that was known as Order Number no. Four, which was not only to confiscate these materials, including materials from public libraries, um, but also to destroy them that they would be gathered together and destroyed and essentially be turned into uh, you know, paper pulp for paper. When this um, order hit the American press, it was highly controversial and librarians protested, journalists protested, some um, members of Congress did as well. This was seen as a kind of reenactment of, of Nazi book burning um, and the, occupation uh, government, the American occupation government was a bit tone deaf. Um, they said, no, this isn't burning, we're pulping this material for paper. Um, and ultimately they had to kind of adjust um, the execution of this policy. And the Library of Congress mission took on this role of um, screening these books and removing 
up to 150 copies as record copies for um, future research and study. Um, so there's a kind of irony here of librarians being part of a process of destroying books. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, many of those books came to the United States and could, can be found in research libraries, um, you know, around around the country. Yeah, you know, I thought uh, one of the things that really struck me was the response of the, I think it was the Pittsburgh Courier. Uh, I mean, that was like just perfectly slotted in there. I mean, I, I don't know if you want to talk about sure. That. So the Pittsburgh Courier is an African-American weekly newspaper, uh, very out there, very bold. And of course, during this time period, there was a huge effort on the part of black Americans to um, make the connection between the war effort in um, abroad and in Europe and the issue of civil rights at home. It was known as the double V campaign or the you know, two Vs for victory um, at home and abroad. Well, the Pittsburgh Courier on this um, question of should um, uh, you know, militaristic or um, racist or anti-Semitic materials be destroyed said, um, absolutely. Um, we have many um, libraries in the United States, which would have, we'd have great book burnings um, because of the kind of white supremacist um, views that are being articulated there. They were the only ones to make that um, literal connection um, between um, a racist ideology in Germany and, and one in the United States. Right, I, I found that you know very, very apt, uh, very aptly put. Um, so, you know, as in in Europe, in the you know the different zones of Germany, the the different Allied zones of, of that are occupying Germany, uh, you know, you have all of these efforts to denazify. Um, to collect materials uh, that were uh, plundered uh, from a huge variety of places uh, and to repatriate them to their, their, their countries of origin. Uh, and then you have um, uh, materials from Jewish communities that uh, don't seem to have owners uh, that, and that also need to be found. And so all of this material or a lot of this material winds up at least the, 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 the uh, book ma material winds up in in Offenbach, a gigantic warehouse that's requisi requisitioned in order to deal with it. Um, you know this this is such a fascinating, fascinating story, and you know also for me, I work at YIVO. YIVO be, is part of this story uh, because um, oh, you know what your um, video froze, so you. Uh, so Evo became part of this story. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Thanks. Uh, and uh, it's so it's so fascinating how, you know, the U.S. Army, which I don't think is uh, was created in order to, you know, collect and redistribute books. Obviously, they did so with the help of a lot of librarians uh, and archivists. Uh, but, you know, this is they really did an incredible job of, of handling this. Um, and I'm, you know, I wonder if you could speak to it, you know, some of the issues in, in the, the deal with Offenbach. Yeah, so you're exactly right to say that this was not anything that the military anticipated. And the Monuments Men, which is the group, the Monuments Fine Arts and Archives Unit, they were the ones who would be in charge of this. And of course, most of their attention was being directed towards, you know, repatriating the artwork. Um, so when millions of copies of looted volumes were found in Frankfurt, in Hungen, in uh, surrounding countrysides, and I should say that this is only a fraction of the books that had been looted. There are many, many that had gone um, east of Berlin and ultimately wound up in the Soviet Union. So what we think at least. Um, but the ones that were in the American zone, um, you know, there, were, there was about a six month period where there really nothing happened. I mean, we think of this as a heroic story and it is, but for six months they were just overwhelmed. And part of the problem was the question of how do you identify these books? Um, the books were written in many different languages, not only German or, you know, many in Hebrew, many in Polish, many in French. Um, and so 
you know, having people just be able to identify them was a real challenge. Um, and I should say that there were two very inventive command officers who came into Offenbach, um, uh, both of them Jewish American, and sort of solved many of the problems that had arisen over the previous six months at the end of the war. And into this would be into early January 1946. First was Seymour Pomeranz, um, whose papers are um, at the Center for Jewish History. Um, and the second was um, Isaac Benkowitz. And they got this, um, essentially what they did was to imagine this as a warehouse, as a kind of industrial production of book identification and um, uh, you know, uh, redistribution. Um, Benkowitz sat at a table looking at books, just he would just start looking at each book and realized at some point that many of them could be identified by their book plates or book stamps. And so he had all of the plates and stamps photographed, um, put into, into albums, and basically the, it was a German workforce at Offenbach, of a pretty sizable number, maybe 140 people, to memorize you know, six book stamps. And if they saw the book stamp, they put the book into a bin. And in that way, they could do a very rough sorting quickly. Now, of course, there were hundreds of thousands of books that could not be sorted in that way. And so what happened to those, of course, is another story. And it involves um, the uh, uh, many Jewish organizations, particularly one that um, becomes known as Jewish Cultural Reconstruction, um, to take control of these books, essentially, and then redistribute them um, to, uh, essentially, they were distributed to the US and Israel with some to other um, countries. The YIVO story, I mean, you can probably tell this story too. Um, the YIVO story is, you know, there was a great deal of concern about what um, might have come into Offenbach that was um, the part of the YIVO collections, the vast YIVO collections. And some of those could be identified pretty quickly. Um, there's some evidence that Seymour Pomeranz, one of the Offenbach leaders um, was kind of played fast and loose with what was a YIVO book and what wasn't and loaded them into um, crates to go to New York. Um, there was a political issue around this because um, restitution according to the law at that time was only to the nation of origin. And of course, in this case, you don't really have a nation of origin even though YIVO was reincorporated in New York um, and that was sort of the argument that was used. And then finally, after um, some point time into this Offenbach um, history, um, Lucy Davidovich, the very well-known Jewish um, historian, um, came into Offenbach uh, and she didn't really intend to do this, I don't think, but wound up spending about four months there identifying books, including many, many volumes that were YIVO books, which she recognized because of, of handwriting or because of a paper um, um, strip pasted on the edge of periodicals. So a kind of deep knowledge of the collection that you, 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 you would need to have in order to identify those books. Right, and, and Lucy Davidovich, she was an aspirant or she, she worked at YIVO before the war. And so she had great familiarity with, uh, with its collections and also with Max Weinreich's handwriting and, other people's handwriting. Um, and her papers are also at the American Jewish Historical Society like Seymour Pomerantz's. Um, so, and you also, you know, in, in this whole story of Offenbach and, you know, the restitution of, um, of these books to the, these places, you also have a very interesting, um, the very interesting role of people like Gershom Sholem, uh, who you don't expect to, to show up uh, you know, he, you know, it's, it's like, you know, if they make a movie of your book, it's this great cameo by this, you know, Hannah Arendt is also there. It's really, you have these major figures, uh, you know, in, um, you know, in Jewish history and philosophy that, that just appear in your, that have cameos in your book. Um, and it, it adds so much. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you could talk a bit about the, uh, you know, that, that aspect. Sure. I mean, Gershom Sholem, I mean, it, it is really wonderful when he shows up and he's, he's, um, 
you know, he's kind of gnarly about it all. He's, you know, I've gotten here too late. All the good stuff has been taken. I mean, he's deeply suspicious and, and perhaps with good reason of the US military authorities. Um, he uh, begins to, ca there's a room that's known as the Torah room, which has all of the um, treasured materials and it's a locked room. Um, and he goes in there and he creates a list of, um, of uh, books and um, manuscripts and other kinds of valued materials. And he category, categorizes them like what's most valuable and what isn't. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the story seems to be that he um, colluded with um, one of the uh, leaders of the Offenbach Archival Depot. Um, and when he, he left, you know, his, his fingerprints aren't necessarily on this, but um, about six months after he left, um, many of those materials, especially the most valuable ones, were packed up into crates and purportedly sent to um, the Joint Distribution Committee, but actually were put on a boat and sent to what was then at the time Palestine, to the Hebrew, Hebrew Insti uh, University, um, which is where they are, which is where they remain um, today. So he has this, um, he kind of enters in and and makes his own decisions about what just restitution is. And I should say that a number of those items were um, identifiable. You know, we know whose they are, but um, in this situation, his sense of what a kind of collective restitution or reparation would be um, overcame any idea of the individual um, restitution. And um, Hannah Arendt, um, I mean, it's also just great to find her. Uh, she was the executive um, director of Jewish Cultural Reconstruction. She was very involved in not only the distribution of the portion of the books that could not be identified, um, but also she goes to Germany and, and you know, is really on the hunt for any materials that have been hidden away. And surely there, as one person asked about other caches, um, she was convinced there were other caches and found some of them. And I think that, you know, many books were likely hidden in plain sight, you know, in a university library, just reshelved. Um, and, you know, my guess is that, um, you know, she, there were many materials that she thought ought to have been um, given to the Jewish community, the international Jewish community, but remained in Germany. You know, it's interesting what you say about um, things being hidden in plain sight. Uh, in 2017, uh, YIVO got a call from the Lithuanian National Library informing us that they had found almost an entire room full of YIVO archives. And, um, you know, we went, our director went uh, with, with some scholars to, to inspect it. And it turned out to be uh, something like 170,000 documents um, in their original envelopes. Uh, you know, it was really an astounding find, and it became part of a project to digitize all of Yivo's pre-war collections. That's uh, almost almost completed, um, but it's really it's astounding. And and you know, the fact that some of this was found, you know, only four years ago, it, you know, it just you know it, it makes you think what else is out there. Um, and someone in the chat, in fact, is asking, you know, what uh, you know had you know is. There are any additional, you know, are there any additional hidden caches? Um, and also, just to add to that, I'm curious to know if you have any familiarity of what happened in the Soviet zone, uh, because I know that they had a tendency not to repatriate things. Right. So the the question of the hidden caches, there could well be um, in private collections material that ought to have been um, restituted. Um, I don't know whether there are still materials in caves, and, and my, my guess is that that material has been found. But um, I think much of it, if it exists, is in private collections, private people's um, libraries. Um, I would also say that in the United States, many of the, um, these unidentified Jewish books came to the US through Jewish cultural reconstruction and were distributed to many libraries of um, of Jewish organizations, as well as some um, non-Jewish universities. And many of those collections can't be found right now. They have, because 
the books were integrated into the collections as a whole, or in some cases, the institutions disappeared and the uh, libraries were deaccessioned. It, at University of Pennsylvania, where we have a center for a CAT Center for Advanced Judaic Studies and a really fine library, um, in our electronic catalog, about 250 JCR books are identified. One of our um, curators has done shelf checking, um, kind of inspired by all of the, you know, uh, this conversation I've had with, with, um, with them. And they have found over a thousand books, many from Lithuania, um, that had come in and had simply been on the shelves. So I think there's much, much more to be um, found, but it will take a real effort to do that. Um, and the other question about the Soviet Union or Russia, now Russia, uh, you know, I think the policy of the Russians was essentially a trophy, uh, war trophy policy um, that uh, they were entitled to take this under, you know, long held views of, of, of warfare. Um, most of that material, um, some of it has been uncovered by a really phenomenal um, historian, Patricia Grimstead Kennedy. Um, I, have, I might have that right, Patricia Kennedy Grimstead. Um, and um, you can read about her efforts to uncover some of this. And at the, at the point when the Soviet Union um, ended and there was a bit of an opening of Russian archives, um, some of these collections were identified, but there's been no real effort to repatriate them or to restitute them. Right. Um, so uh, and there's a question. Uh, some, I mean, this is this references, uh, you know, the, the librarian at Penn, um, you know, finding a thousand books from Lithuania. Um, this person asks if, uh, you know, people are actively, you know, seeking out these these books in markets or elsewhere in Europe, um, you know, that you may have run into during the course of your research? Um, I don't know if they're looking for them in that way or like on eBay or whatever, but I do know that there are um, uh, university libraries and state libraries that are quite interested in identifying these collections. And that's been a fairly recent, I'd say the last 10, 20 years or so, that has been a real effort um, uh, on the part of a, a German um, libraries to, you know, take responsibility for this past and to be accountable for the collections that they have. Right. Um, I just want to note if uh, if people do have questions, uh, you should put it in the uh, Q and A section. Um, we seem to have addressed all of them. Although, uh, oh, here this is here's here's someone's asking uh, what's what's the line between spy and information gatherer? Where, where, where do you draw that line? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, so for me, um, a spy is somebody who is gathering secret intelligence. Uh, now, an intelligence gatherer or intelligence agent might be someone who gathers secret intelligence from an informant, for example, or steals the information. My people were gathering what we what at the time was called open source intelligence or what the intelligence community today calls open source intelligence. So that would be material that is published, that is in the uh, readily available to you. One of the ironies is that once it gets into the intelligence agency, it is then classified secret and takes decades and decades for it to be declassified. Right, so they, they become spies. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that appears to be uh, all the questions in the uh, question and answer section. Um, I want to thank you so much. This has been a terrific conversation. Um, again, Information Hunters. Uh, I just spent the past two days reading it, and it is compelling and uh, extremely well written, extremely well structured. I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, I think anyone who's interested in World War II history, it will broaden your conception of the of what the war effort was, uh, and. Uh, uh, and anyone who's interested in, in the book trade will also be, uh, will find this book uh, terribly interesting. So uh, thanks so much, Professor Pice. Thank you. It was a pleasure.